now move to the third talk in the series, and that's Tomas. Hi, I'm uh, Tomas from the Department of Pharmaceutical Technology um, in the University of Basel, and I had my pr privilege of doing my PhD at the Swiss Nanoscience Institute, where there was a great emphasis in collaborations between different departments, and this led to a great collaboration with the Department of uh, Chemistry University of Basel, where we tried to develop uh, artificial cell mimics with the idea of kind of circ circumventing um, established cell culture and having ready to use assays that can be used just like real cells as sensors uh, to test antibody binding or substances permeability through them and we first tried this by using poorly synthetic materials so we took poorly synthetic uh, lipids and we took poorly synthetic polymers and we tried to make giant unilamellar vesicles in the micro scales for polymersomes and liposomes to use them kind of as a uh, sensors, but then we realized one thing that if you use purely synthetic materials, it's very high, hard to get to the complexity of the cell. And this led us to the idea of using cells themselves to form microspheres that inherit both the cytosol and the plasma membrane of the cell, plus equipping these with functional elements, so equipping them with functional polymers, lipids, or even nanostructures in their cavities to use them as some kind of an assay. Now, this looks kind of like this. Um, once you add a certain vesiculation buffer to the cells, you get these microspheres out of them. And this project kind of also developed when we started to work with exosomes and we realized it takes a lot of cells in an incubator to get a tiny pellet of exosomes where it would, with this system where we basically just take the plasma membrane of the cell and the cytosol of the cell, we were much more efficient. And this was a re recent uh, review from Nature where they showed that what, which elements these uh, microspheres inherit and they weren't so much different to those of exosomes. Plus we, then we showed that we can equip them on demand, for example with different kind of lipids here, I'm showing the fluorescent ones because it's what it's easier to visualize, but we could also um, modify them with a functional polymer, so cholesterol polyethane, cholesterol PEC, which increased their stability. But we couldn't al also modify their, uh, in their membranes, we also modified their inner cavities. So we showed that there's a linear dependency on how much of a substance there is in a cell that gets transformed, uh, tra transported into these uh, cell mimics. And it didn't then end there, you can't see it here, but we at some point even encapsulated 40 nanometer sized nanoparticles within them. And this led us to a, the idea, let's try to modify this with these things with specific enzymes, but to get the, an enzyme or something functional within them, you need a nanocarrier. For this we used, uh, we first tried with conventional liposomes, pegylated liposomes, and we even went to eat more uh, sturdy polymersomes, which allowed us to have a great complexity within them. So depending on which kind of uh, dye or molecule we encapsulated in the polymersome or liposome, this got also transferred to these microspheres. Um, yeah, and it, they retained a free diffusion within them acting like kind of artificial organelles. Uh, and then this was a, based on my PhD project where we developed artificial organelles. We, we, decided let's take a polymersome, equip it with a membrane protein that makes the, so this polymersome made of PMOXA, PDMS, PMOXA. Let's encapsulate an enzyme, horseradish peroxidase within it, and then let's take a substrate, but for the substrate to enter this polymersome, we also had to equip it with membrane proteins. So we took OMPF and reconstituted it in, in the membrane. Once this, if these vesicles got in touch with cells, they got uh, taken up by an endocytotic pathway, 
and they even remain stable within the cells. And we also tested the system in a vertebrate model where we showed in a zebrafish embryo that the enzyme stays preserved and continues to do its reaction in the presence of substrates. And this led us to develop a system based on what I presented before, to take these GPMVs, these microspheres, and encapsulate polymersomes within them, and then also encapsulate polymersomes with horseradish peroxidase, which allowed us to, take, to make confined reactions in cell-like com microsphere compartments that are fully compatible with both flow cytometry and microscopy techniques. Um, yeah, and this comes back to what I mentioned with the production. It's much more efficient than working with exosomes but because once we did a calculation, if you fill up uh, a whole um, incubator full of uh, 10 centimeter plates, you have about 2 billion vesicles in 24 hours. And these vesicles are still microsphere, so they're much, it's much more material than uh, liposomal or, or exosomal material. So if you extrude them, you get about 2,000 nanovesicles out of one of these. Um, and then we <coughs> shot this thing into a zebrafish, and we were quite surprised that if they're pegylated, they remain stable in blood flow. So their, their cargo remains encapsulated, but also their membrane remains intact. And also the, um, if we equip them with these uh, nano reactors, so to have a confined enzymatic reaction within them, the reaction continues in the zebrafish. If you're interested in the zebrafish as a pharmacological model that we're using at our Department of Pharmaceutical Technology, you should contact Sandro. He's giving a speech at uh, uh, 2 o'clock where we show that we can use this model as, um, to do pharmacokinetics of fluorescently labeled um, liposomes or polymersomes within them. And with this, I'd like to come to the acknowledgments. I thank the group of uh, Jörg Kugler who support this group and uh, this project in the in vitro and in vivo application and the Department of Chemistry who d where we developed the whole uh, technology. And now we're, we already have uh, uh, products that, from, that, can we, that we can use as uh, binding assays, that we can use as permeability assays, and we're planning to maybe found a company out of this, uh, Arcella basically making complex things, complex things, cells simple, and the simple things unique for researchers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tomas. And the uh, talk is open for questions. Hello, thanks for the very interesting talk. I think it's crazy that these artificial cells can be so stable. Did you monitor how many days they so can survive? The stability tests we had were up to 14 days. Uh, we didn't, <laughs> we're now running long-term stability tests, but the, in, it did, in 14 days, we're just leaving them on a bench, so sealed. If we, we done experiments also where we can freeze them and now we're working on lyophilization experiments to have these as a kit so we can actually get the material rehydrated and then start using it as a binding assay, permeability assay. How so about on. the stability in the zebrafish? In the zebrafish it was about eight hours that we tested mm -hmm. in the circulation. If we inject it in the peritoneal space it was about 16 hours. Um, yeah. Because in the circulation, it's obviously you have the shear stress, so it gets deposited at a certain point where the blood flow isn't as fast, and then at some point, an erythrocyte comes and just knocks it out. Okay. Which is still quite uh, long, quite a long time, because the zebrafish we had were uh, three days old, and that's about so one eighth of the lifetime of the fish. No. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Ralf Dimpelmann from Basel Air Swiss. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. There are many, many possibilities here. I was wondering, you are thinking about a company. What would be the first, let's say, commercial application uh, where a potential customer would use it? So the first commercial application would be that we would offer these things out of 15 or 20 different cell lines, well-established cell lines is first, and then you could use it as antibody binding as, uh, I don't know, nanoparticle permeability assay. So you can do all the assays that you want because the 
enzymes of the cytosol stay preserved in, the, in these G, GPMVs. And the membrane integrity also stays preserved. So you can do, we can even get ATP in them at this point. Uh, so we could even use them as a G-coupled receptor assay. So it's a quite broad application. But at first, the simplest thing you could do, you could just add liposomes to them, see if they fuse with the system, or add antibodies to them and see if it binds on certain sites. Mm. Thank you. Are there other questions? If not, thank you, and uh, we see each other in the big room again. Thank you very much for being here.